They call it liquid gold, a sweet miracle that lasts for centuries, an energy source so perfect it powered empires. But the truth of its creation is far more astounding than any myth. What if I told you that the smooth golden honey you drizzle on your toast is the result of a logistical, chemical and architectural masterpiece executed by a six-legged flying machine that works herself to death in just a few short weeks. It begins not in a factory, not in a field, but in a world so alien to our own that its complexity rivals the inner workings of a supercomputer, the honeybee hive. The colony itself, a pulsating city of sometimes up to 80,000 individuals, is not merely a collection of insects, it is a single super-organism, and its survival hinges on one singular, relentless goal. To stockpile enough fuel to survive the looming winter months. Honey is not a luxury for them, it is life itself. It powers the worker bee's muscles, maintains the hive's furnace-like temperature of roughly 93 degrees Fahrenheit, and feeds the young. But the production line that creates this perfect food is a multi-stage biological symphony, beginning miles away from the hive entrance with the brief, frantic life of the forager. Imagine the worker bee, now about three weeks old, having just graduated from her internal hive duties, cleaning cells, feeding larvae, attending the queen, and finally becoming a guard. Now she is given the most dangerous and physically demanding job of all. The forager, the pollen jock. Her adult life in the peak summer season will last perhaps five or six weeks. And in that time, she is an utterly dedicated drone of industry. She flies out not aimlessly, but armed with a phenomenal biological GPS, an internal clock, and a finely tuned sensory system. To us, a field of flowers is a beautiful, chaotic canvas of colour. To her, it is a topographical map of subtle electrical charges, UV light patterns, and pheromonal signposts left by previous foragers, guiding her to the precise location of the richest reward, nectar. This nectar, secreted by the flowers to attract pollinators, is, to be blunt, a pretty poor food source in its raw state. It's mostly water, sometimes 70 to 80%, with a high concentration of sucrose. This makes it volatile, prone to fermentation and entirely unsuitable for long-term storage. But the bee sees past the watery fragility to the hidden sugar within. Using her long straw-like mouthpart, the proboscis, she sucks up the sugary liquid. And this is where the transformative chemistry first begins right inside her tiny body. The nectar isn't swallowed into her digestive stomach. It is held in a secondary compartment, a specialised organ called the honey crop, or what's sometimes called the honey stomach. It's a briefcase, essentially, for transport. But the clock is already ticking, even while flying as she zigzags between potentially thousands of flowers a single bee must visit up to two million flowers to contribute enough nectar for just one pound of finished honey. Her saliva is doing complex chemical work. An enzyme called invertase is introduced from her hypopharyngeal gland. This enzyme begins the slow, deliberate process of breaking down the complex sugar, sucrose, into two simpler, more manageable sugars, glucose and fructose. This critical act is the very foundation of honey's stability and sweetness, yet it is only the first step in a process that requires a collective effort of epic proportions. The forager, 
her honey crop filled with perhaps 40 milligrams of liquid, nearly half her own body weight, begins the long, arduous flight home. She flies at up to 17 miles per hour, battling wind, avoiding predators, all while using a portion of her precious cargo just to power her flight muscles. Her trip may be miles long, but her memory is photographic. She knows the hive's location and, astonishingly, she knows how to communicate the exact direction and distance of her flower field discovery to her sisters through a language that still astounds scientists. The waggle dance. This isn't just a simple wiggle, it's a precise geometric map performed on the vertical face of the honeycomb, a tiny dancer providing polar coordinates, complete with adjustments for the sun's position. A perfect, silent communication of critical intelligence. Upon landing at the hive entrance, she is greeted not by rest, but by a receiving crew of younger house bees, who haven't yet earned their wings outside the nest. Here, the raw, partially inverted nectar is transferred through a fascinating mouth-to-mouth -mouth process called trophallaxis. The forager regurgitates the nectar, passing it to a waiting house bee. This younger bee then begins the second critical stage of enzymatic treatment. The nectar is chewed and bubbled, drawn up into a tiny drop on the bee's mandibles, and exposed to the warm, dry air of the hive. This bubbling process serves two purposes. It continues the enzymatic breakdown with added enzymes, and it marks the beginning of the crucial dehydration process. The house bee will continue this transfer, relaying the processed liquid from one sister to the next, in a human-like assembly line that can last up to 20 minutes for a single drop. This continuous passing and stropping reduces the water content significantly, but it still isn't enough. The nectar, still perhaps 50 to 70% water, is too dilute to be safe. If left as is, the natural yeast spores in the air would activate and cause the mixture to ferment, destroying the colony's winter food store. The solution requires a feat of micro-engineering and atmospheric control. The liquid, now partially processed, is carefully deposited into the cells of the meticulously constructed honeycomb. These cells, geometric marvels, are perfect hexagons, a shape that provides maximum storage capacity using the least amount of beeswax, a principle of efficiency that human engineers still study. The cells are angled slightly upwards to ensure the still runny liquid doesn't simply dribble out. Now, the third, most labour-intensive stage begins. Evaporation. Thousands upon thousands of worker bees position themselves throughout the hive, shoulder to shoulder, and begin to fan their wings in unison. The noise is a constant, low, thunderous hum. The sound of an organism literally breathing. This collective, ceaseless fanning creates an intricate ventilation system, a constant warm breeze that sweeps over the open cells. The goal is to aggressively evaporate the excess moisture from the watery nectar. They must drive the water content down from over 70% to a precise 17 to 18%. This is a fine line. Too much water and the honey spoils. Too little and the honey can crystallize too quickly. The bees regulate the internal climate of the hive with breathtaking precision. Keeping it around 93 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, the ideal temperature for the chemical reactions and rapid evaporation to take place. As the water content drops, the mixture undergoes a profound transformation. The simple sugars, fructose and glucose, become supersaturated, meaning they have more sugar dissolved than water can typically hold. This dense, viscous and now chemically stable substance is finally honey. 
the high sugar concentration and low water content create a naturally hostile environment for nearly all bacteria and microbes, which is why honey, stored correctly, is one of the few foods that can truly last forever. It is also why another enzyme introduced by the bees, glucose oxidase, is so vital. It produces a trace amount of hydrogen peroxide, a powerful antimicrobial, as a natural preservative. The bee is not only making food, she is turning it into a fortress. When the liquid gold has reached this critical level of perfection, with a water content of approximately 18%, the final sealing ritual begins. Worker bees, who create beeswax through eight paired glands on their abdomen by consuming vast amounts of honey themselves, it takes roughly eight ounces of honey consumed to produce a single ounce of wax. Begin capping the cells. A delicate, pristine layer of beeswax is laid across the open face of each hexagonal storage unit, sealing the honey away from moisture, air and contamination. This wax cap is the definitive sign that the honey is ripe, cured and ready for long-term storage, a survival provision for the winter cluster. The creation is complete. But to truly appreciate the honey, we must rewind and understand the silent, unseen power governing this incredible infrastructure, the hive itself. The entire colony operates on a principle of efficiency and collective labour divided strictly by age. A worker bee never chooses her job, she evolves through them in a fixed sequence. From day one, she is a cell cleaner, then a nurse bee, feeding the young larvae with protein-rich bee bread and the precious royal jelly for potential queens. Then, a wax producer and builder, an internal housekeeper, a guard bee, and finally, the ultimate sacrifice, the forager. The forager's life is brief and intense, and she works until her wings are frayed and her body gives out, a testament to the selfless genetic programming that puts the colony's survival above all else. The honeycomb itself is a masterpiece of energy efficiency. The hexagonal cells are not only structurally sound, but the perfect insulator, and they help the colony conserve the heat necessary for brood development and for ripening the honey. It is a biological structure so flawless that architects and engineers have only recently begun to fully appreciate its mathematical elegance and structural genius. The honey stored in the outer rings provides insulation, while the brood nest, the central area where the queen lays her 2,000 to 3,000 eggs a day, is kept at that constant warm temperature. The entire complex is a climate-controlled, self-regulating food factory, guarded by highly disciplined soldiers, governed by a single queen and powered by an unparalleled work ethic. Consider the cost. To produce a pound of this perfect substance, the collective colony must embark on roughly 55,000 miles of flight. That is enough to circle the globe more than twice. It requires the specialised labour of hundreds, if not thousands, of individual workers. Each bee contributes only about one-twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in her entire lifetime. Yet, a healthy colony can produce over 55 pounds of surplus honey a year, a mind-boggling collective accumulation. It is a story of ultimate teamwork, where the individual's sacrifice leads to the species' continuity. What we take home in a jar is more than just sugar. It is concentrated solar energy, carefully gathered, biologically transformed and meticulously preserved by a tiny insect civilization whose complexity rivals our own, yet operates with an efficiency we can only dream of. Every spoonful is a testament to the silent, tireless work of the small female warrior whose name we know but whose heroic effort we rarely pause to appreciate. But there is a shadow on this golden story. The fragile complexity of the honeybee world is under threat. The magnificent logistics of the hive, 
the tireless flight of the forager, and the perfect chemistry of the honey-making process rely entirely on the availability of rich, diverse and unpolluted nectar sources. As our environment changes, as floral resources dwindle, and as the challenges of colony collapse disorder persist, the honeybee, this tiny, crucial architect of our ecosystem, is fighting for its life and for the future of our food supply. The miracle of honey is a fragile one, inextricably linked to the health of the entire planet. So the next time you taste that familiar, sweet warmth, know that you are tasting the literal, life-giving essence of a million flights, a million tiny miracles of chemistry, and the unwavering dedication of a collective soul. It is the story of survival, written in gold. If you enjoyed uncovering this profound, cinematic mystery of nature with me, the journey into the hidden worlds all around us is just beginning. Don't miss the next incredible story of survival, engineering and unbelievable science. Hit that subscribe button, like and share this video to help us bring these vital, fascinating stories to a wider audience.